Okay. Well, again, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the fourth edition of our tutoring session, which will um, work around the topic of neurology. Um, we have three presenters tonight. The format will again be approximately 30 minutes per presenter with 10 minutes of question and answer afterwards. Um, we do have uh, uh, Dr. Peterson here with us this evening, and we also have Dr. Haggerty here with us this evening, and I think Dr. Pescura is uh, with us remotely as well. Um, but um, we will try to answer questions in the chat area, or you can just unmute yourself and ask questions. We would uh, like you to keep your questions till the end of the presentation, uh, if that's, that's all possible, um, but you can put uh, questions in the chat at any time. Okay, and our first uh, presenter this evening, uh, back by popular demand, is Natalie Saliba. Uh, Natalie is a graduate of the University of Alabama at Birmingham's Neuroscience Program, and she is a current medical student at the Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine in Auburn, Alabama. In her free time, Natalie loves spending time with her new nephew, going on walks with her dog, and creating art. Natalie's favorite part of anatomy is head and neck anatomy. So without further ado, I will give the floor to Natalie and you can go ahead and share your screen if possible. Okay, just let me know if it works. Okay. Do y'all see it? Yep, can you forward it? What'd you say? Can can you forward it to the next slide mm. to see if it works? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Okay. So I have the anatomy of the nervous system. So we have a lot of different objectives, basically looking at the functions, um, the anatomy of the central and the peripheral nervous system, and then the sensory and the motor components. We're going to identify the lobes of the brain and the function of them, and then talk about the difference between the somatic and the autonomic nervous systems. And then we are gonna talk more about the um, anatomy of the spinal cord, the white and gray matter, the ganglia, spinal nerves, and then identifying the five special senses. So for the central nervous system, this consists of the brain and the spinal cord, whereas the peripheral nervous system is more of the nerves and the ganglion. As you can see, like right here, it's more of like the outside, whereas here's the central. And then the spinal cord in the middle is also the central nervous system. So uh, the uh, ganglion are also, we'll talk about more of this later, but they're just little cell bodies that exist um, in the peripheral nervous system. And the mass of the brain, you can see right here, is a cerebrum. And it has a right and a left hemisphere. So it's mainly this, can y'all see my uh, cursor? Thumbs up if you can see it. Okay. So it's going to be like the mass of the brain right here. And then there's a structure called like a mini brain. And that's the cerebellum. And it's going to be right here. And then right here is um, the brain stem continuing into the spinal cord. And we'll talk more about the functions later. But it's just um, important that there is the distinction between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. And then the fact that there is a right and a left. And they're identical, the right and left. So of the brain, you have neurons, which are just like the basic cells of the brain. And they have supporting structures called glia. And it's this uh, myelin you can see right here. They're going to talk about that later. But it just supports for nutrition and protection of the neuron. And the neuron has many different structural components. You have the cell body, and then you have the axon. And this is where um, it connects to another neuron. You can see it up here, how it connects from the cell body to the um, terminal right here. And so the long portion right here is the axon, and that's the white matter of the brain. And the communication occurs when the chemicals travel from the cell body down the axon to the synapse, where you can see right here, it releases little chemicals to the next neuron. And neurons come in all shapes um, for the nervous system. 
And as you can see here, the neurons can be first, second, or third order. So let's say for this track, um, the spinal thalamic is like um, right here. You can see that there's like the third order, the second order right here, and how it connects to a first order neuron. So there's three neurons that are connecting through from your brain, down your brain stem, down the spinal cord, and out into your body. And again, they have different shapes to help this function. So like I said earlier, the white matter is the axons of the neurons. And you can see this right here. This is like a cross section of the brain, this white matter. And then the gray matter is the cell bodies. And you can see that more on the outside right here of the brain. It's just like a darker section. And so in the peripheral nervous system, the bundles that we call the axons are referred to as the nerves. So you can kind of think of that, how it displays in the central. And then as you can see right here in the spinal cord, it's kind of the opposite. The white matter, which would be like the axons is on the outside, whereas the gray matter is going to be more on the inside of the spinal cord in this like butterfly shape. And this is like important for like different pathways of the brain um, and a lot of research. So like here's like a little picture of them like lighting up the different um, white matter tracks of the brain. And um, you can see that right here. Okay, so the spinal cord has many components. It has spinal nerves, roots, and ganglia. And so the spinal nerves are just the bundle of axons that connect the um, to the spinal cord. And they have, they are the fusion of the dorsal and the ventral roots. And you have the sensory and motor axons in this. And there's actually 31 pairs of spinal nerves throughout the body. And I kind of showed this right here, as you can see, like how it comes out from the vertebrae to how it goes into the body. And then, so for the roots of the spinal cord, it's gonna be this and this right here. There's a dorsal root that connects from the sensory, like allows the sensory neurons to enter the spinal cord, and then the ventral root, which allows the motor neurons to exit the spinal cord. And then the ganglia are groups of neurons, um, the cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system, and we showed that earlier. They were like kind of right here on the outside, and it's just continuous with um, the root as like an enlarged structure that you can see right here. And so Ganglia are like the peripheral nervous system's version of cell bodies, whereas nuclei in the central nervous system is the cell bodies there. And then, so this just kind of shows like how the sensory motor works throughout the spinal cord. There's this little graphic. You can see that the pin pricks the skin right here, causing pain through a nociceptor. And we'll talk about the nociceptors later, but it causes pain. It travels up and it travels through um, the dorsal root right here. Or yeah, yeah, through the dorsal root, through the sensory neuron right here. And this is referred to like as an afferent signal. And then it is transmitted right here onto the um, motor neuron, which sends the motor signals down to your muscles. And this is through the ventral root, and this is considered an efferent signal. So afferent is always gonna be with Sensory and efferent is always going to be with motor or like a way. And then this just shows um, how the central nervous system has um, different components. You have the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system and how it interplays with like the somatic nervous system is going to be all external, how your body um, is in space and the external signals. Whereas the autonomic nervous system is going to be internal. So heart rate, blood pressure, kind of stuff that goes inside your body that you're not really aware of sometimes. Good graphic, a little chart to show this. So here's your central nervous system. It's just kind of separate out here. And then here's the peripheral nervous system. It has two components. It has the somatic and then it has the autonomic. So the somatic um, is just going to be voluntary actions. So it's just kind of like, uh, there are supposed to be little arrows right here instead of these boxes, but it's, you move your hand onto the stove, you feel that it's hot, and then you move your hand away from the stove. So it's your perception that you are doing this voluntarily. Whereas autonomic is going to be involuntary actions. 
or functions. And so this is later divided into three sections. So it's going to be sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteric. So the sympathetic is the fight or flight response. It's kind of like they talk about like if you see a bear, what do you do? Your heart rate increases, digestion slows, and then adrenaline is produced to make you fight or flight. And then parasympathetic is the rest and digest just when you're at your calmest state. So your heart rate is going to slow and digestion increases, et cetera. And then while digestion is with these two, it also like has a separate nervous system of its own just to maintain it throughout. And it's called the enteric nervous system. And then this just controls the smooth muscle movement, the blood flow and the secretions of the GI system. And so here is the brain and the different lobes of the brain. And so for the frontal lobe is this little beige or pinkish beige color. And it is going to be executive function, planning, reasoning, problem solving, more of like personality components as well. So like the story that we're always told is a Phineas Gage. He was stabbed through the head right here at work. I think he worked on a railroad and it impaired his frontal lobe, but he still survived. And so after he survived, he was like a very hardworking, respectful man. And then he turned into a like very bitter and angry and he had like no inhibition of his own emotions. And so that's really the function of the frontal lobe. And then of the frontal lobe, you have the motor cortex right here. And it's just this little section before the parietal lobe happens. And the motor cortex is just for voluntary movement. Um, and then the, sim or not voluntary movement, but just movement that is, um, I guess, like a gross movement, not necessarily like coordinated movement. And then you have the somatosensory cortex right here of the parietal lobe. And then that's going to be for sensations. And I included this little picture right here of what exactly happens as you can see like say something gets injured right here on the outside it's going to affect more of your face and your arms whereas if something gets injured more towards the top of the brain it's going to affect of the somatosensory cortex it'll affect like your legs and then this blue part is the parietal lobe so it's going to be pain and temperature and then two-point discrimination is basically like close your eyes and let me touch your elbow versus your hand, just the knowing the difference between that. And then just spatial relationships. Um, the green is occipital lobe and that's gonna be for vision, the depth and identifying an object. The temporal lobe is gonna be for language um, and forming memories. And the temporal lobe has like different components for language, so it's really interesting because if you knock out certain parts, then maybe you can talk, but you don't, have the right words that you're saying. You just have word salad, stuff like that. And then the brain stem right here in this yellow part is just the basic life functions like breathing, heart rate, and it connects the um, cerebrum to the spinal cord. And then what I was talking about earlier, the little mini brain, the, that is the um, cerebellum. It's for coordination, posture, and balance. And so it's like movement, but it's more like the fine tuning of movement. And so let's say if you have an injury there, then you have like a very staggered gait, you may um, be wobbly and not walk in a straight line, that sort of thing. And then so for our special senses, first we have vision or sight. And so we have like the anatomy of the eye. And so the sclera is the white part of the eye. The cornea is like a transparent membrane right here that allows light to enter. The choroid supplies the blood to the actual eyeball, the outside, and then the ciliary body is a muscular structure, I think you can see it right here, that um, bends the lens to focus it onto the light, and the lens is like a transparent structure that focuses the light to the back of the eyeball, and you can see it right here. And then the iris is the colored part of the eye. And it's a, basically a smooth muscle that opens and closes the eye or the pupil. And then the pupil is the hole in which the light enters. And then the retina is going to be, I'm not, oh yeah, it does show it right here. It's going to be the uh, like the most inner part of the eyeball. 
and it has um, nervous tissue for photoreception and little cells on it. And then the optic nerve that you can see right here, it carries that signal from the retina to the occipital lobe of the brain. And so the second one is hearing. So sound waves are gonna travel through the large part of your ear, which is called the oracle, into the canal, and it's gonna vibrate against the eardrum, which is called the tympanic membrane. And then this vibration is gonna move these little three bones in your ear. You have the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And it's gonna move um, into the like with the pattern of the vibrations. And then they're gonna push across uh, other inner ear structures. And so you have the cochlea, which is right here. And so this is mainly for sound, while the vestibule up here is mainly for balance. And so there are two nerves in the ear. So you have the cochlear nerve and the vestibular nerve up here, which transmits this into the brain. And then for taste, your tongue has little bumps called papillae and they have little taste buds and they have special receptors that bind to the chemical for the corresponding um, taste. And then these signals are passed into the major nerves that innervate the brain. And you have five basic tastes. You have sweet, sour, salty, and umame. Umame basically just means savory. Um, and as you can see here, the little histology of the um, papillae. And then for smell, this, um, when breathing, the chemicals enter into your nasal cavity right here and it connects with muscle and tissue. The tissue has many layers, as you can see right here, and it transmits the smell to receptors for the major nerve of olfaction, which is the olfactory nerve. And this takes the sensations to the brain, but as you can see here, the olfactory nerve travels through the cribriform plate. You can see right through here, these little holes in your skull and comes down into the tissue. And so, Right here, the cribriform plate, since it has these holes, it's an easy way for pathogens. There's like a certain um, bacteria that we learn about that can like go inside of your brain through these little holes. And when the olfactory nerve, it takes the signals and it transmits it to the limbic system. And the limbic system is just um, parts of the brain that are more for emotional aspects. And so Different smells can be associated with different emotional memories. And then for the last one is touch or somatic sensation. So there's different things that can be associated with. It's pressure, vibration, light touch, tickle, itch, pain, and temperature, and proprioception. Proprioception is like where your body is in space, how you know where your arm is in respect to your body, for example. So there's many different receptors of your skin. You can see here the different receptors. These that are like highlighted, you don't have to know the specific names of these, but these are just different mechanoreceptors. So nociceptors, they sense pain. Thermoreceptors sense temperature. Proprioceptors sense where the body is in space. Mechanoreceptors sense vibrations and pre pressure. And then you have specific mechanoreceptors that we talk a lot about in school for your mus musculoskeletal system. Um, the Golgi, Golgi tendon organ is the stretch of the tendons and then the muscle spindles since the stretch of the muscles. And those work together to like prevent injury of the muscles and make sure you don't stretch your muscles too far to the point that they get injured. And then here are my references. If anyone has any questions. Natalie, uh, could you go back to the tongue uh, slide? And Dania has a question. So Dania, could you unmute and ask your question? Oh, sorry. I just like didn't really like get it. Sorry. I was just needed to look at it again. 
Okay, so um, basically it's just the bumps of the tongue that you can probably see when you look in the mirror are just papillae. They have taste buds inside of them. It's kind of hard. The tongue isn't like as explicit as like the eyeball, honestly, but just that the taste buds have little receptors that bind to different chemicals in your food. And so the five basic tastes are just sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. So. Thank you. And then you don't have to know these specific fungiform, fibriform, all that. That's just to show you all the different papillae that are on your tongue. These graphics are kind of too much sometimes. We did have a question of, is there any way we can print the diagrams from this PowerPoint? So maybe Dr. Prescura could answer that question. Hey everyone, I, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm chiming in from the car driving back from seeing family for Thanksgiving. Um, so we do publish all these recordings on our YouTube channel, but um, for this first year, we're not going to be giving the PowerPoints themselves just because we haven't had a chance to vet them yet um, and, and the content in them. So um, I will say that pretty much any of these diagrams you guys can find in anatomy textbooks. Um, and then additionally, on our website, we have some links where you guys could find some of those, um, especially through the American Association for Anatomy website it has a lot of those resources on there. Dr. You, can, oh. you can also screenshot if you need it to take notes or something, you know. Yeah. Um, Dr. Pascara, yeah, that's good. Thank you. do you guys publish the recordings? The recordings, yes. Those are on our YouTube channel. Uh, it's just, I believe it's just called The Anatomy, um, but you can find the link to that directly from our website, anatomy.org. Um, and then go to the tutoring tab, and that should take you to the link to our YouTube channel. And additionally, the most recent uh, tutoring recording is posted directly onto that page. We have a little time if anybody wanted to ask further questions. Uh, Banana Bangers is asking, what do the vestibular and cochlear do? As in the nerve or just the structure? Because the cochlea is for sound. So anything that you hear, the vestibule is going to be for balance. And it has like three, it's interesting. It has like three different um, little rings that go in the different planes of the environment. And so it sends little crystals throughout the fluid to make sure you are where you are in space. And then if those get dislodged, then of course you're dizzy. And then the cochlea just has little hair cells that um, move whenever the sound comes through. That sends it through the nerves to the brain. All good questions. Do we have other questions? Does anybody have just general questions for Natalie uh, as far as what it's like to be a medical student or or how did you get to where you're at or anything like that? So you do you go roll tide or is that your, is that your school? I mean, honestly, neither. I don't really watch football, but my parents are Auburn fans. So. Oh boy. That was a yes, tough one yesterday. People, <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Danny asks, can you explain the somatic and autonomic one yes. more time? Um, so somatic is going to be uh, voluntary actions. So I want to get up and go get a glass of water, that type of thing. Or if you touch a hot stove and you move your hand away from it, 
it doesn't always have to be like your conscious perception, but it's a voluntary action of your body. Whereas the autonomic nervous system is going to be involuntary functions of your body. And so it can have three different parts right here. And it's going to be sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteric. So sympathetic is if you see something scary, then of course your heart rate is going to increase. And it's not your voluntary control. You don't have the control over your heart rate to increase. And then if you do see something scary, then your digestion is going to slow and your body's going to produce adrenaline to make you either run away or fight whatever is scary. And then the parasympathetic of the autonomic is going to be more as like a calming feature to um, your heart rate slows, digestion increases, more of the things that like keep you alive and sustained. And then enteric is just a whole separate thing. I, I like how I think about it is that sympathetic and parasympathetic are opposites. And then enteric is just its own thing. And it um, controls the smooth muscle of the GI, the blood flow, the secretions, just to kind of keep your digestion going and um, have no issues there. I hope that explains it better. Uh, Emily is asking, what is the application for medical school like? Um, well, whenever you get into college, it's about your junior year, kind of how you start applying to colleges in your junior year of high school. It's kind of like that. You take a really big test, which is the MCAT, and it's kind of like the big test, the ACT to get into college, but it's for to get into medical school. And it's going to be, um, that's pretty much your big ticket to get in. And you have an application on this national website that you use, um, either if you want to go MD or DO, you use different ones. And it asks you everything that you've done in college, all your volunteer work, all of your experience shadowing, um, your MCAT score, your personal statement, why you want to be a doctor. It's a big application and it takes a lot of time to fill out. Um, but the earlier you do it, the earlier you have interviews and it's very rewarding afterwards. But it's definitely a long process. <laughs> Okay. Anybody have any further questions? Uh, all good questions this evening, as usual. Um, do you need her to explain anything a little bit more before she goes? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, Natalie, I, th I think you are uh, off the hook. I don't see any more uh, questions. So you can unshare your screen. Thank you again for all your help with the anatomy this year and being an inaugural tutor. So very, very nice job. Thank you. All right. We will move on to our second topic, uh, histology of the nervous system. And also backed by popular demand is uh, Zachary Zook. Zach is from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and graduated from Pennsylvania College of Health Sciences with his Bachelor of Science in Nursing. He is currently a second year student at Drexel University College of Medicine in Pennsylvania. He is interested in orthopedic surgery and anesthesiology. If not on campus studying, which I can assure you he is a lot, uh, you can usually find him at the local pickleball court, in a rock climbing gym, or playing some beach volleyball. So, Zach, if you are with us, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a little cold for all of those activities now, unfortunately, but you know, it's how it goes. Also, <laughs> great pronunciation of the word Lancaster. I'm very impressed. There, there is a Lancaster, Ohio. So I I guess I cheated. <laughs> You're familiar, fair enough. Um, all right. Well, hi everyone. Welcome in. Um, I am presenting on the histology of the nervous tissue. Um, I would say that there, there's a decent amount of things to learn, but a lot of them are fairly bulleted. Um, obviously, you can look at the 
kind of like the terminology things that you need to know on the anatomy website. Um, but we can go ahead and get started. So our learning objectives, I'll just read through them quickly just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, describe the structural components of a typical neuron. So specifically, we want you to be able to, be able to identify a cell body, the dendrites and axons and an axon terminal. We kind of be able to tell the difference between what those are and what they do. Describe the three different morphological categories of neurons. So there's a lot more than these, but these are kind of the three that we want you to focus in on and know, which are multipolar, unipolar, and bipolar. And then describe their general um, location. Um, I'm not sure why that word got cut off, my apologies. Correlate the histological structures of myelin with their locations. So um, central nervous system versus peripheral nervous system um, and their roles in the action potential conduction and its speed. And then describe the organizational layers within the peripheral, peripheral nerve, including their connective tissue sheaths. So we'll kind of go through all of this um, and I'll have some histological slides um, and then just some regular pictures to help demonstrate it um, a little more clearly. So the nerve, obviously what we're talking about is the nervous system. So I thought it would, this would be a good way to get started. Um, we just went over central nervous system versus peripheral nervous system. So central nervous system is the brain, the cerebellum, the spinal cord, and then peripheral nervous system is kind of everything outside of that. Um, so generally how we think about things is you kind of start in the peripheral nervous system. It travels up through the nerves into the spinal cord, gets processed in your brain, and then you react accordingly um, by kind of coming back down through the, the spinal cord and out to your muscles or um, other tissues that may need to be innervated. So parts of a neuron, um, we have the dendrites, which are kind of like the, the feelers, I would say. Um, it's how the neuron senses things. Um, sometimes these dendrites can be hooked to different kinds of um, pressure plates or temperature um, sensors. So it's kind of like how the neuron is sensing it. And then the neuron has a cell body um, where all of these dendrites come together and, and it kind of uh, in different types of neurons, it's processed a little differently. This is a multipolar neuron. So all of these dendrites will kind of cumulate in, in um, a signal, they'll send it through the cell body and then the signal will travel down the axon. So the axon is kind of how this nerve will communicate with other nerves or with muscles um, or with other things that it needs to intervate. So the the signal will travel down the length of the axon and then it arrives at the axon terminal bulb or where it synapses, right? So there's like um, the axon can kind of split right at the end into little smaller axons. And then each at the end of each of these, there's a little bulb called the axon terminal bulb or the synapse. And so these may, like I said, this may innervate um, a muscle or it, it may communicate with another neuron and then it passes um, neurotransmitters across the synapse and, and does whatever it needs to do um, in the next step. So a histological view. So if you can kind of think about a neuron, they're tough to get in kind of a slice section, right? Because if you can see here on the left, it kind of wiggles its way through and it's not a, it's not exactly in like a 2D plane. You can't really draw it on a piece of paper, it kind of wiggles and goes everywhere. So it's, it's tough to get a full axon or a full neuron in, um, in a histological slice. So this is kind of what they would look like. This is kind of a fascinating um, picture that I found. I'm not exactly sure how this was, how this was radio labeled or what was done with it, but obviously you can see um, this is like the axon. This would be the cell body. These would be the dendrites kind of sensing things. And then it has its long axon and then the axon terminal or synapse here towards the end. I'm not exactly sure where this end is here. Um, but when we're looking at this um, histologically, this here is kind of something that we might see, right? And, and what's fascinating is this here is actually the cell body, which can be kind of difficult to um, find if you don't know what you're looking for, right? And then the things around this are actually the cells that help keep these neurons alive. They're called um, neuroglia cells, um, which isn't super important for this, but so this here is what an axon body might look like um, in, in a various place. So yeah, like I said, it, it can be kind of tough to see just because of the way that they're three dimensionally organized. Um, they don't they don't slice well, but we have some better pictures um, or histological views a little later on in the in the slideshow. 
So now we're going to go into types of neurons, right? So we have unipolar, bipolar, and multipolar neurons. So a unipolar neuron is this would be the dendrite end, and then you kind of have the, a dendrite coming down. And then this is kind of a weird way that it's connected to the cell body. Usually the um, kind of the impulse will actually just travel straight from the dendrite straight through to the axon, the axon terminals. So the the, um, the nuclei and the cell body is kind of recessed somewhere else and just helps to keep these this part of the the cell alive, but doesn't actually isn't actually involved in the relaying of information, which is kind of cool. Then you have a bipolar neuron, which is a little bit different. So you have the dendrites over here, and then the signal would go directly through the cell body, and then it comes out on the other side through the axon and then to the axon terminal. And then a multipolar neuron, which is kind of the most common, um, which is you know here. Are the dendrites, here's the cell body, the dendrites are kind of directly attached to the cell body, each individual dendrite, and then it passes the signal um, down along to the axon, down along its axon to the axon terminal. We'll dive in a little more into these. So a unipolar uh, neuron, um, it, it, in invertebrates, they're called pseudounipolar. It's kind of a weird um, specification, but you can, we, for for the purpose of this class, we're just going to know them as unipolar neurons. These are purely sensory neurons, right? So these are always kind of coming from your fingertips. The way I like to think about it is they're always coming from your fingertips to your brain, right? They're never um, going from your brain to your muscles. They're just sensory neurons. Um, and the cell body is actually often really far away from where the stimulus is, or from where the signal is begun, right? So if you think about this, this here would be um, the, well... I think this here we can would say we would would be the dendrite end, right? So this might be out in your fingertips, and then this is actually this um, kind of this dendrite is going to go all the way up through your arm to your spinal cord, and then there's this there's a kind of a, a cool thing right outside your spinal cord called the dorsal root ganglion, which is where the, all of the cell bodies for these sensory um, innervations come are kind of live. So all of the cell bodies live in this thing called the dorsal root ganglion, right? So this is in the dorsal root ganglion. So you can think this is out your fingertips all the way to your spinal cord. And then this part, the axon will actually go um, either into your spinal cord and will synapse here in the gray matter, or it might actually go up through your spinal cord and synapse somewhere um, in the brain, which again is a little beyond the scope of this class. But so you can see here, here's the axon of this, right? So you have your dendrites, the impulse from your fingers as you touch your desk, you can feel it. It travels all the way down through this, down through the axon, and then to the axon terminal or the bulbs, which are you kind of more pronounced here on the end. Um, but this, yeah, I, I think that this is a really fascinating just because this part here of the nerve is usually really, really long. I mean, if you think about it's kind of so small and it's going all the way from your fingertips or from the tips of your toes all the way to your spinal cord. Um, yeah, they're just, it's a very long neuron um, when you start thinking about it on the scale of, of cells in your body. Next, the next one we have is called the bipolar, um, which is the, so again, this structure here, right? So you have your dendrites go straight through the cell body and then to the axon, the axon bulbs. And these are kind of, these are the least common type. They're really found in two specific places in the olfactory, um, which is your smell. And then in the retina, which is also in your eyes. So this here is, you can see the eyeball here, and then there's kind of a close up. Um, it's not a histological view, but it's a little more, um, you know, characterized or so that we can see it. And here's the bipolar cell, right? So you have light coming in this way, actually, which is kind of fascinating, hitting your rods and cones, which are specialized cells. And then they're passing that, right? So you have your, your dendrites here interacting with these specialized rods and cone cells. And then they're picking up the impulse, sending it through their cell body and then to another ganglion cell. And then that ganglion cell is going to go into the brain to help you process what you're seeing. So it's kind of a specialized, and then it does a similar thing in the olfactory or in your nose, um, where this here kind of these cells more just process and then send along send along that signal um, right through their cell body. So that's where bipolar neurons are found. And then we have the multipolar neuron, which is the most common type in the body, right? When you think of neurons, this is usually what you're going to think of. Um, and often there's lots and lots and lots in the brain. Most of, you know, a lot of the cells in the brain are broadly ca characterized as multipolar neurons. Um, and you have multiple dendrites coming straight off of the cell body, right? So it's not like um, in the, let me see if I can go back. 
It's not like in the bipolar neuron where all of the dendrites sort of accumulate into one, which enters the cell body. This is a little different where it's all of the dendrites attach directly to the cell body. And then the cell body kind of um, processes and accumulates that signal and then sends it down um, its axon when it is the appropriate time. So there's multiple dendrites coming off the cell body, but then there's always only one axon coming off of this cell body in the multipolar neuron. So um, myelin is the next thing that we're going to talk about. And some of you might know what myelin is already, but essentially it's a, it's a lipid rich wrap that wraps around the cell axon, right? So here you can see multiple different um, myelin, myelin sheaths, and it increases the speed of conduction, right? So when we don't have myelin, um, kind of the way a cell works is it needs to depolarize or conduct an electrical signal down its length. And so um, if you think about this multipolar neuron, right, as this signal travels down its length, it needs to depolarize each part of the axon. And it's a very slow process. And when I, when I say slow, you're talking, this is still traveling at meters per second, right? And so this is, <laughs> when we think about how quickly these things are actually happening, this isn't a very great depiction. It's, it, both of them are rapid. But when you think about, you know, a regular neuron or a non-myelinated neuron versus a myelinated neuron, um, this conduction can actually, because it's it's almost like insulated at certain spots, it jumps from node to node, right? And so it increases the conduction because it doesn't need to depolarize this entire segment. It just needs to kind of go from this node to this node to this node. And these, these are called the nodes of Ranvier. It's kind of the space between the different myelin wraps. And so, um, like I said, the myelin, it's a, it's a lipid rich wrap and it increases the speed of conduction. Um, and how, how this myelin wrap kind of forms is you have um, a glial cell or kind of like a helper cell. Um, and it, they're different in the, C, in the central nervous system versus the peripheral nervous system. And essentially it just wraps itself around and around until you get this tight lipid rich wrap around the axon. And that kind of insulates the axon so that um, the electrical signal can kind of jump from, from node to node. So here you have a node of Ranvier, then you have a myelin wrap, and then we would have another node of Ranvier here. Um, but it's kind of an interesting process um, about how the myelin actually wraps around the axon. And so we said that there, there's differences in the CNS or central nervous system myelin versus the peripheral nervous system myelin. So in the central nervous system, uh, the myelin is made up of um, oligodendrocytes or oligodendrocytes are what do the myelination, right? And so um, in, in, this, in this sketch, you have the oligodendrocytes over here, and you can see that the, this oligodendrocyte has multiple nodes on this axon, right? And even more so, it has multiple nodes on multiple axons. And so, or multiple segments on, on multiple axons. And so oligodendrocytes um, kind of are very dispersed, right? They have a lot, I, the way I like to think about them, they have lots of feet in a lot of places, right? Um, and so they can kind of help wrap multiple different neurons, multiple different axons. And they're um, here you can even see this axon is myelinated by two different oligodendrocytes. And this is really common in the CNS. This is in comparison to the peripheral nervous system where um, the myelination is done by Schwann cells and it's only one axon segment at a time, right? So each kind of uh, myelinated segment here is its own Schwann cell, right? And so this is a Schwann cell and this is a Schwann cell and this is a Schwann cell and this is a Schwann cell. And so it's it's very different from the central nervous system or from oligodendrocytes where there's multiple nodes, multiple different axons. The Schwann cells are kind of specialized. They're only one place on one cell. Um, and here you can see this is the bipolar neuron, um, the same thing. So this is the axon. This here would probably be the dendrite coming in. Um, so the signal would be passing this way. And then here you have the cell body kind of set off, recessed off of the, um, the way of the, of the impulse. Um, but yeah, like I said, so that's the difference between peripheral nervous system myelin and central nervous system myelin is the oligodendrocytes do multiple segments, even multiple axons. Schwann cells are only one axon segment at a time. So what does this look like histo histologically? So this is actually the myelin wrap. You can see the myelin wrapped around and around and around. And then this is the axon um, 
segment. So um, it's kind of interesting. This is, I guess, kind of part of the, it's not the cell body, it's the axon. This would be a mitochondria in here, which is kind of cool you, to see. Um, you still need ATP in the axon segment. So the mitochondria is making the ATP. Um, but then this here would be the nucleus or the cell body of probably in this case, the Schwann cell. Um, and then it's wrapped itself around and around and around this axon. Um, and so here's, this is kind of a close up and you can see it. This here's a, a little bit farther, farther out, but same thing, the axon here with the myelin sheath wrapped around and around it. And then this is um, just kind of the inside of the axon actually, and, and the cytoplasm of the, the axon and um, it's doing its functions it needs to do to be able to pass on that signal. So how are nerves bunched um, in specifically the peripheral nervous system? So when you think about it, we have, you, know, you have thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of nerves coming from different places, from your feet, from your hands, and it would be kind of messy just to have them um, scattered throughout your arm. So most nerves run in nerve bunches, right? And so here you kind of see that there's kind of three layers to think about, right? You want to think about individual neurons, and then you want to think about bundles of neurons. And then you kind of think, or which is called a fascicle is a bundle of neurons, a fascicle. And then there's bundles of fascicles. So there's kind of three layers to this, right? And so this here does a pretty good job of depicting, depicting it. So we can start with the axon, right? So you have an, this is one singular, one singular cell here and kind of the coding um, or fascia that surround this axon is known as endoneurium, right? So endoneurium or is the kind of like the inside most end, you know, like the end most inmost um, part um, surrounds one axon. And then you have the perineurium. So you can see there's multiple axons within here. So this is the endoneurium, right? And now the perineurium surrounds kind of this bunch of neurons or this fascicle of neurons. So that's the perineurium is kind of the middle, middle one. And now you have this, this here, it does actually a really good job. You can see there's multiple fascicles, right? So here's a really large fascicle. Here's a smaller fascicle. Here's a smaller fascicle. And then this epineurium is covering or bundling all of these different, um, the, these fascicles. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of the way you want to, that's at least how I think about it is epi is outside. Endo is kind of the most inside or the most basic. And then perineurium is in the middle. Um, and so you go from a single axon and then endoneurium, and then you have multiple axons covered by perineurium, and then you have, you know, multiple fascicles all covered by epineurium. And that is, and so some of these, um, for example, a lot of you have probably heard of the sciatic nerve, the sciatic nerve, um, this kind of nerve bundle as a whole, um, it's actually really large. It's a couple centimeters wide. And when you first see it, it's fascinating in a cadaver lab. Um, but it's actually a lot bigger. It, it looks like Kind of like a large artery when you first see it it's just like a little more yellow and a little more um like a whitish shine to it uh, but it's really cool to see and so some of these um this epineurium or these bundles of fascicles can actually be can actually be quite large um so yeah just a little fun you guys end up going to medical school you all see the sciatic nerve and yeah very cool thing to see um and so in review this this is kind of yeah i would say know these two histological views um pretty well be able to identify kind of the different layers and then be able to pick apart um yeah the different like what does you know what is the function of different parts of the nerve and what are the different types of nerves um but like i said they can be kind of difficult to see histologically um but this here is a really good histological view um specifically of myelin, um, that is, yeah, pretty high yield thing to know and be able to recognize. So and I believe that is everything. Are there any questions? And I can't see the, the chat, Bill, so I don't, I don't, or Dr. Frank, I don't know if you wanted to if there was anything that came across the the chat while I was talking, um, I don't I don't see anything yet. But um, does anybody have questions for Zach? It's Dr. Peterson. I was just hoping that you could go back to that 
previous slide, if there's any way that you can actually um, enhance um, this particular image, if they can get a sense that the dark dot in the middle is the axon that's surrounded by the lighter staining material, which is the lipid material, especially on the H and E stain. I think they would find that really helpful if that's possible. Um, so wait, is it this slide or the previous slide? It would be this one or, or the other one, whichever one is easiest, but the H and E uh, stain of the, the, the nerve itself. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're you're wanting me to pull this up a little closer? Yeah, if you can. I'm trying to think. Okay, let me get out of this. Um, let me. There we go. And then we can just zoom in on it. Perfect. See if it'll let me zoom here. That's it's awesome. Not, yeah. That's super clear. But that's really helpful. Yeah, and so what you were saying is like, um, kind of like, you know, the the inside here is sort of the cytoplasm of these axons, and then this darker is actually the myelin, um, which we were talking about before, which is kind of you know like the outside, the darker part of this. So you can see that actually really well on here. How these are these are each individual axons, and most of them are myelinated. It looks like. Excellent. Thank you, Zach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so this is actually a really great, yeah, this is a good picture of a fascicle, right? You can see like it's kind of a bundle of different axons um, and then there would be perineurium kind of surrounding this fascicle. So yeah. Cool. Uh, okay, Zach. Yes. Um, we have a question. Could you explain the bipolar nerves again? Yes. Let me go back and then see if I can. Hmm. How do I start a slideshow? I need some help here. Oh, here. It was hidden. There we go. Um, yeah. So the bipolar. So this is um, the bipolar. So again, we have the dendrites up here, right? But all of these dendrites, right, it might have a lot of different kind of like arms or legs or whatever you want to call them, um, will all converge on a single dendrite, right? And so a nerve impulse, it'll be started from up here. So say this is, um, right, so here. So when light hits these, these are considered rods. So when light hits these rods, maybe if light hits just one of them, um, that actually won't send an impulse all the way down this dendrite, right? Maybe it wasn't a large enough impulse, but when light hits both of these rods, the combined kind of impulse that gets started will actually, they'll meet up right here. So this is a common dendrite. Well, actually, this impulse is now large enough that it's going to reach this cell body. And then this cell body is going to amplify that signal and send it down through down through its axon and then it's going to synapse and in this case this is again in the retina and the eyes it's going to synapse on a ganglion cell which is going to convey that impulse to your brain um, and so these like I said these bipolar neurons there's kind of a bunch of dendrites that all come together to form one dendrite that's going to send that signal down the dendrite length through the cell body and then down through the axon um, to the axon terminal or the synapse. Is that helpful? And maybe Zach, if, if you don't mind, I'll just add to that, that when we talk about uni or bi or multi, we're talking about the number of cytoplasmic extensions from the cell body because every neuron has just one axon. So those sort of uh, prefixes that are numeric are just letting you know, hey, how many cytoplasmic extensions from the cell body for this particular neuron should I expect to see? So I think that's really helpful and it's memorable. Um, I, I would definitely um, make sure that you understood that. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. That I don't know if I've ever actually processed that, but like, <laughs> it's so that's good. Yeah. So 
uh, like Dr. Peterson said, it's how many cytoplasmic extensions, right? So you have your unipolar here, there's just one cytoplasmic extension. So you have your dendrites and then this is your axon, but um, it's called a unipolar because you just have that one. And then bipolar, there's two extensions and then multipolar, it's, there's lots and lots and it's multi. So cool, I like that, that's good. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Oh, uh, Dr. Dr. Frank, like you're still muted. Okay, now I'm now I'm alive. Uh, I don't see anything further. So, Zach, I am going to let you unshare. And thank you again for sharing your knowledge with us this evening, and uh, being a part of the anatomy tutoring team. Um, so our last presenter, uh, again, back by popular demand, is Gabe Costa, and he is going to be talking about the embryology of the nervous system, especially neurulation. So Gabe is in his second year at Drexel University College of Medicine at West Reading. He graduated from the University of Chicago, where he studied political philosophy. After a number of years as a carpenter in rural Vermont, he decided to pursue medicine and obtained a master's in medical science from the University of Vermont. When they are not studying or working, he and his wife, Sarah, are with their children. Currently, their five-year-old daughter wants to be a ballerina trash picker-upper, and their eight-year-old son wants to be a subsistence farmer guitar maker. Gabriel loves the three-dimensional nature of anatomy and is in awe of the embryological development. So without further ado, I give the floor to Gabe for the uh, embryology subject neurulation. Thank you, Dr. Frank. Um, just to check, are you guys just seeing the straight slide or are you seeing my notes and everything around it? Um, the last. You see all my notes. Oh, boy. All right. Um, thank you. Well, let's see here. Um, one presenter view. anybody have any uh, tech tips that's worked for me last time around? No? Okay. Um, I am so sorry. I'm going to run down to the other device, and I will utilize kind of a dual setup here. Okay. So I will uh, ask Dr. Peterson, um, any valuable tips on studying and how to approach uh, this material, especially the, from this evening while we're waiting for Gabe? Right. I think if it were me, I would definitely stay focused on the learning objectives and whether you all did some kind of concept mapping or you created some kind of digital flashcards, I would definitely use your own strategies to help you make this information your own. It's It all seems really straightforward when someone else is explaining it, but really you have to be able to explain it to a classmate or a family member so that it makes sense to them. And that's when you'll know if it's actually making sense to you. Great, thank you. And Gabe, are you? I'm good to go. 
Good All to right. go. Okay, then the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. So, sorry about that little uh, hiccup there. Okay, um, so we're going to cover neurulation in embryology, and we're still, um, and this is the process by which the early structures of the nervous system to develop. Um, our plan for this session will be for me to place neurulation in its proper context by briefly summarizing what my colleagues have already covered um, in prior sessions. Um, we'll review gametogenesis, fertilization, implementation, implantation, and gastrulation. We'll then go over the learning objectives, after which I'll provide a more detailed overview of neurulation itself. And there will always be time for questions at the end. Um, so in let's review. So gametogenesis is the blanket term that covers spermatogenesis, neogenesis. You guys covered this in your prior session. Um, you discussed how the gamete cells were produced for mitotic proliferation through fetal development, through a period of meiotic rest in both males and females. And then you guys went over how in females, the germ cells are lost prior to birth, how follicles are formed between, formed between birth and puberty, and how upon reaching puberty, the oocytes are released during a menstrual cycle. You review the stages of the menstrual cycle and how they relate to the development of the follicle into an ovum. And then these three stages and their corresponding hormones of the follicular phase with the follicle stimulating hormone, ovulation accompanied by a surge in luteinizing hormone, the luteal phase, during which the corpus luteum surrounding the ovum produces progesterone. You guys also went over the growth and maturation of sperm cells within the testes. Um, and the specific uh, structures and cell types that play a major role in the process from the seminiferous tubules where the germ cells reside to the nutrient providing Sertoldi cells and the testosterone producing Leydig cells that mean help to maintain the overall process. And then you reviewed um, finally kind of the content of the ovum and sperm as they exist prior to fertilization, which is as haploid gametes that each contain a single copy of the parent's chromosomes. Um, so as a reminder, as we move into um, fetal um, and embryologic development, we kind of anchor our discussion in terms of days and weeks corresponding to the typical stages of development, with day zero set as the day on which fertilization takes place. Um, and that fertilization takes place in um, the... Um, Sorry, and that fertilization takes place in the uterine tube where the sperm cell encounters the ovum. When this encounter takes place, the acrosomal enzymes on its cap are activated by contact with the corona radiata of the oocyte um, and allow the sperm to burrow through the zona pellucida into the cytoplasm and then release its nuclear um, contents into the oocyte. At this point, the haploid sperm and oocyte combine to form a diploid zygote on day one, and that stimulates mitosis. Um, over the next couple of days, the cells divide to form a, and eventually end up as a morula, which is kind of the 16 uh, morula meeting um, mulberry. Um, and then further differentiate into a blastocyst composed of an outer layer of trophoblastic cells. Um, with an attached embryoblast um, or inner cell mass on the inside, which I hope you guys can see where my cursor is indicating here. Um, at this point, so we've kind of traveled down the tube um, and then um, the blastocyst attaches to the wall of the uterus and implants during days sort of six through 10 with the endometrium ultimately enveloping the embryo into its wall. During week two, the bilaminar, um, just to Again, to review bilaminar, meaning two-layered disc develops from the inner cell mass um, with the epiblast forming the dorsal. Um, and I think of dorsal, I think of like a dorsal fin on a dolphin or a shark. Um, helps you remember that it's on the back layer and the entirety of the embryo where the hypoblast forms the ventral uh, layer. And then we saw that the Hypoblast surrounds the blastocyst cavity, which then becomes the oak sac, while the epiblast surrounds the amniotic cavity. Um, then at the end of week two, a thicker region of the epiblast arises, which becomes the primitive streak. And this goes on to define the cranial, meaning the head and caudal, um, think like your tailbone. So um, there aren't any feet at this stage 
orientation of the embryo. In week three, the disc develops from bilaminar into a trilaminar, so three-layered, in the process of gastrulation, and the hypoblast uh, becomes the endoderm while the cells of the epiblast differentiate into the ectoderm and from the primitive streak, the mesoderm. These three distinct layers um, each go on to form the basis of distinct parts of the developing body. And if you recall from the last session, you discussed the embryology of the musculoskeletal system, which is a derivative of the mesoderm. So here are our learning objectives for this session. Um, and it's gonna be on the development of the neurological structures that eventually become the nervous system. Um, and again, that's the process of neurulation. Um, so over the course of the next few minutes, we'll describe the formation of the neural plate, discuss the outline, or we'll outline the steps through which the neural plate transforms into the neural tube, we'll discuss the origin of neural crest cells and describe a bit about the migration of neural crest cells and what their ultimate fates are. Um, I think for this session, we aren't gonna go into teratogens or developmental anomalies. Um, so that's, that will be, um, I suspect, at a different point in the future for you guys. So the formation of the neural tube, um, at the end of week three, the embryo has developed into this trilaminar disc. And one of the two derivatives of, um, of the epiblast is the ectoderm um, that lines the amniotic cavity, um, which you can see kind of illustrated here. Uh, and a rod-shaped structure derived from the mesoderm lies along the midline of the embryo. Um, this is the notochord. Um, it is just above this that the ectoderm cells start to thicken here, um, becoming the neuroectodermal tissue that makes up the neural plate, um, which again is illustrated in this, uh, in this cartoon with the purple color here. Um, and the neural plate is differentiated from the surrounding ectoderms, the blue um, in this image, uh, by a border that will become the neural crest cells, these neural plate borders here. Um, when these images or images like this come up a lot in uh, textbooks and in kind of when you go searching for this stuff online, and uh, kind of to stay oriented as we move from this image up here down to this one here, I've highlighted the locations of the ectoderm. Um, so you can see they've kindly kept us color matched here. So blue for ectoderm, blue for ectoderm. Um, and in essence, we kind of rotated our viewpoint counterclockwise about 90 degrees. Um, so you can see that the amniotic cavity, which is this light blue color up here, would fall above our um, our plate here as we continue. Um, and then I want you to uh, please take note of the image up here that I'm highlighting, um, which indicates the ectoderm is this kind of blue blob um, with a red line that highlights the primitive streak running along the midline. And I think this is kind of a useful reference for us as we move on uh, to think about the kind of orientation or three-dimensional space. Uh, so as the, if we go back up here, you'll see that, so here's our neural plate um, and the green neural plate borders that will form the neural crust cells. Um, so as these cells proliferate, um, they start to kind of deepen down and form a groove that uh, is above the notochord here. And the sides of the neural groove are called the neural folds here. Um, while the edges um, up here, and we can see in green, uh, indicated as the neural crest cells. Um, and these crests of the, if you want to think of it as a canyon or a, um, start to get closer, start to grow towards one another. Um, and ultimately they meet in the middle and merge with one another. Um, and the cells here of the neural fold uh, then form a tube, which we very creatively call a neural tube. I've drawn a little bit of a cartoon here uh, for you guys. It's just kind of an important note that 
will prep you for later understanding about some of the developmental defects that can occur, but it's also just to orient as we, we think about the process of neurulation. And that's how the convergence of the neural crest cells takes place over space and time. Um, and it's not as though you're folding or rolling a, a, a piece of paper and attaching the sides. It actually starts to pinch more or less along the midline of that groove and um, then closes both uh, cranially, so towards the, the head and caudally towards the tail or foot um, from that initial point of convergence. So I've tried to keep our color coding here. So here are green neural crest cells, the blue for our ectoderm. If you can imagine is that we were looking down on this from the top here. Um, and the cranial end, Dr. Peterson may correct me on this. I think it's tends to close around day 25 um, and the caudal end tends to close slightly later around day 27. Um, to briefly take a look now. So if we pop back up here, we'll see that this is in the process of forming a tube. Um, we've talked about the kind of the, the convergence that happens above it. And now, so now here are the layers of that neural tube. Um, so you've got the lumen, which is formed again, if you don't mind me jumping back and forth a little bit. So that's what's being formed here. And as it's pinching off, it has the um, same contents as the amniotic cavity. And then it's surrounded the, by the ventricular layer, which is where we see those glial cells we talked about um, for the central nervous system, um, where my, my colleague Zach and uh, Natalie talked about in, earlier in this session. And the kind of generally speaking, the mantle layer here becomes the gray matter of the central nervous system, while the marginal layer becomes the white matter of the central nervous system. So if we proceed here, we've now seen that our neural tube is formed and that's now all of these purple uh, in the cartoon here. So we've got kind of a tube, fairly narrow looking lumen here in the middle and the ectoderm across the top. Um, and during the process of that kind of convergence uh, that we looked at, that I, um, the green layer, those neural crest cells get pinched off from the developing neural tube and then are also then pinched off from the ectoderm, which becomes continuous across the top. Um, and that then they are left with this kind of this other layer that's between, um, between those two. Um, and the ectoderm here will form, go on to form a variety of other structures, including you know, the epidermis, um, as we're, um, you'll see in other uh, sessions. And then please do note these kind of two red blobs here um, represent the somites. And you may recall from your session, the prior session, um, those are parts of the paraxial mesoderm and form the basis of the musculoskeletal system in the dermis. And finally here, or not finally, but um, the neural crest cells then start to migrate and in this cartoon, it's kind of represented as these two um, rods that have gone to, to form sort of parallel rods to the neural tube. In the actuality, they start to spread out in a much more complex um, manner as they, they move away from being that plate that lies above here, the neural crest cell layer. Um, and the kind of key thing to remember is that the, from a neurodevelopmental standpoint, the neural crest cells are what form the peripheral nervous system. Um, so if we go back to um, what Zach and Natalie talked about, you had kind of your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is derived from the neural tube while the peripheral nervous system you know, generally speaking, is derived from the uh, neural ectoderm, or sorry, from the um, from the neural crest cells. Um, 
And looking at this image, again, you'll come across images like this, um, or you may see uh, histological images. And it sort of helps me to orient to the longer term development when I think about the notochord, uh, which goes on and lies sort of parallel to the neural tube. A function of the neural tube will be to form part of the spinal cord and in the notochord contributes to the formation of, of the, um, the vertebral column. So if, again, you recall that up here is our dorsal aspect or our back, um, you can start to think of the long-term development as we kind of grow and develop, uh, this will become that, or contribute to that vertebral column. This will contribute to the spinal cord, um, which means this is our back. And then this is the structures that start to develop, you know, all of the other stuff inside the body um, that's more towards the front. Um, and then as kind of a final note, we wanted to touch on some of the neural crest cell derivatives. Um, and Again, there are a couple of different ways to think about this. For some folks, it may be helpful to have a <clears throat> mnemonic like this. So Motel Casa um, gives you the primary derivatives of neural crest. So you have your melanocytes, um, which go on to uh, the kind of pigment forming cells for our skin, our odontoblasts, which are the source of teeth. I mean, in medical school, we don't really talk about teeth very much, I'm afraid. I think that's a, that's a dentistry thing. Um, and then tracheal cartilage and pterochromaffin cells, um, which are these neuroendocrine cells in the gut, um, the cartilage in the larynx, and then craniofacial structures, bones, and so forth within in, or, um, in, the, uh, in the face and head. The arachnoid and pia matter, um, which are layers surrounding the central nervous system, the Schwann cells, which uh, Zach talked about. Um, the spiral septum here is um, another term for it, it's the aorticopulmonary septum. So that's in the development of the um, this kind of spiraling shape that takes place later on um, during development between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. And then all of the ganglia. Um, if you wanted to narrow it down to just the nervous system, you can think of it in terms of the neurons and the glial cells, plus the kind of the functions within the adrenal medulla. Um, so in the neurons here, you have your dorsal root ganglia, your autonomic ganglia, or referring to the all ganglia here, and then contributes to the sympathetic, parasympathetic, and erenteric nervous systems um, in the peripheral nervous. And then those glial cells, so our Schwann cells, which we talked about as kind of forming them, those myelin, um, peripheral myelination, and then satellite cells, these supporting cells. And that about does it for that. So I know that was a pretty rapid review, but if anybody has any questions, um, Okay, I encourage you, if you have any questions, now's the time to ask. Um, Annika is asking if there are, the presentations are posted anywhere and not just the session recordings. So. And again, as, as Dr. Pistura said, we're not, for this inaugural year of the competition, we're not posting the PowerPoint presentations. We're only posting the recordings on the Anatobe website um, through our own Anatobe YouTube channel. But you can definitely go to the website. <clears throat> 
under uh, the tutoring tab, and you can find the most recent of the recordings. That will happen um, sometime later tonight or early tomorrow morning. And then I think Dr. Haggerty um, suggested if you're if you're a little bit concerned about not getting all of the information, you want to take some notes, you can stop the recording and just screenshot uh, each of the, the PowerPoint slides. I think that could be really helpful for, for some of you. But again, I would say you have to figure out a way to make this material your own using the learning objectives, which all of the presenters really um, did a good job of staying focused on. So try not to go above and beyond um, the learning objectives, at least for the competition. I could say that screenshotting and writing notes under it is a uh, is a pretty. I've certainly done a lot of that through med school. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, are there... okay, just a question in general. Is it possible to go to a community college and transfer to a four-year school and still be, be able to apply for medical school? So it's open to all the our med students. I don't know that I have a specific answer on the community side. What I can say is that there are a lot of pathways to medical school. Um, I got into college and told myself that I was never going to take any of the STEM classes. I wasn't going to ever going to do organic chemistry or any of the rest of that. And lo and behold, a few years later, I went back um, and did do the kind of required coursework in a variety um there are post-baccalaureate pre-medical programs if you ended up getting your degree in something else or you took a more circuitous route um and then it's how earnest you are and the story that you tell um that's true to who you are and they'll listen Maybe I can just add to that. Um, I think more than 50% of all college students actually start um, their college studies at a community college. It's a little bit more reasonably priced. They offer really good kinds of tuition um, programs at a community college. And sometimes taking your, um, as as Gabe said, taking some of your prerequisites, you're not sitting in an auditorium with 400 other students at the large university. For most community colleges, the classrooms um, are relatively small and you'll have more time to interact with your classmates as well as the faculty. It, it does mean though that, you know, there's a, a transition then when you do transfer to a four-year school where some of those classes will still be relatively large and you have to navigate a pretty large campus. I think you have to kind of weigh all of the, the pluses and minuses for starting at um, something at, at an institution where you know you'll spend a couple of years and then transfer on to another institution. So, yeah. I just, hi, I'm Dr. Haggerty. I just want to add to that. Um, hi, Gabe, you did a great job. Gabe was one of my older <laughs> my my students I had at when I taught at Drexel. Um, anyways, um, I have two bachelors, a master's, and a PhD. And a lot of people hear that and go, "Wow, she, you know, you're really educated." It's kind of like, did you start at a community college? I started at a four. <laughs> I started at a bachelor's program uh, to get you know a chemistry degree didn't really know what I wanted to do, ended up doing um, this uh, project with the anthropology students. And then I went to the anthropological research uh, facility in Tennessee, which is known as the body farm. And this is where they do like decomp studies on cadavers and 
I became really interested in forensics. It led into pathology, medical legal death investigation, and then finally anatomy. So um, yes, you can go to a community college. You can go and get an associate's degree. You can go to a four-year college. Um, my suggestion is uh, you just keep, try to go to people, ask questions like you are now. Ask us about our journeys and you know, be sure when you're going about, you know, keep in mind what you want to do and what do you need to do that. Um, and, it, and it's okay if you're not sure you want to start a community college, but, you know, when you move to a four-year call, another four-year college or medical school, can you transfer some of those classes? Can you, um, you know, what can carry over? And then also just like, what do they require for you to go to medical school? Cause that can also help you decide what you take it, your, your, um, community college. So things like that, but yeah, you can do anything you can put your mind to just keep that in mind. You guys are amazing and you're going to do amazing things. And as long as you believe in yourself, you can really do it. Um, somebody also asked in the chat, if anatomy is going to be an annual thing. And as one of the coordinators, I would say, I hope so. Um, that's really a number one goal of ours. Um, so, and people like the students here and you coming and then you know, doing the tutoring sessions will help that happen. So thank you for being here. Okay, we had another question from Annika. How would you recommend conducting research as a high school student? Uh, still a freshman, so I don't plan to start for a while, but just thinking ahead and it'd be, really cool experience and also really good for college and med school applications. So is it too early to um, think about research? I think we should let the medical students chime in on that first and then maybe um, Dr. Haggerty and I, or, or, or um, you, Dr. Frank, can throw in our two cents worth. Any thoughts, Natalie or Gabe? I suppose sure if the exactly opportunity were to present itself and if it was something that you found really interesting, and I think that's kind of a driving thing. It's people are relatively sensitive to, to the difference between kind of a deep interest that's coming from from you um, and the versus sort of there is, there's a school of thought around just kind of checking a box um, and being deeply interested is what's gonna sustain you. I will say for me, I didn't have like access to do research. I grew up in like a very rural small town. So it was impossible to do that in high school. So if it's not possible, then don't worry too much about it. It's not going to make a life or death decision for your college applications. But once you get to college, there's going to be tons of opportunities. You can even ask your finance, not financial, uh, academic advisor, and they can get you plugged in. That's how I got plugged in into a research lab. And it helps if you go to a college that does have research. I went to like a very research dominated college. So there's tons of people wanting to work with undergrads. And for my major, it was actually required that we were in research. So it just depends on where you are, but it's not a make it or break it thing. If you're not interested in it, then don't do it. You can always do volunteer work that you're interested in that makes you more competitive for medical school. And I guess I would say, you know, I would talk with your um, high school teachers because they oftentimes have connections with um, college faculty members where if they know that you're really interested, for instance, Natalie mentioned that she was a neuroscience um, um, major. So if they know you're really interested in neuroscience or you're really interested in histology, they can sometimes facilitate those kinds of introductions, whether they end up being electronic through email or through a zoom session um, but they can get you connected it is it is hard as natalie said because research 
the equipment, the supplies, um, sometimes the cells that you'll be utilizing for your research or the animals like small rodents. It, that that's all expensive. But if you're, you know, if you really are, like everybody has said, if you're passionate about something and you're willing to put in the time, I think you'd be surprised at how often um, college faculty members are willing to help a young high school student kind of get um, involved at a very basic level at research. And that sometimes can be a stepping stone to the undergraduate research that you do and maybe helps you, you know, really decide, I really like this lab, I really like this faculty member, the institution was close to where I'm from, and all that kind of helps you make that decision as to what college you should go to. So that's all something to think about. I'll add on to that. Um, uh, sorry, I keep walking around. I have two small children who did not consent to being on video. So I just want to make sure I don't include them. Um, so I would say high school research, I agree with what everybody's saying. Um, as far as finding high school research, counselors, um, also reaching out to people here, like it, in asking us, I know like in Reading, there's the Science Research Institute, and this is a, a part of, is it Albright College, Dr. Peterson, I believe, Albright College, and there's a woman who specifically reaches out to high school students, and she does research projects with them, and they're even publishing papers, and she really tries to give them the opportunity to research that they want to focus in. Um, there's, you know, and it's all over the place. You might have to do a little bit of work on your end, Googling and such, but um you know, there's, there's, um, I, I went and I, I did, I did not get an MD degree. I got my PhD and I got it in anatomy, but my lab and other labs would actually, they were part of like the American Heart Association. So if you can go to their website, um, I do believe you can apply as a high school student and they'll send you to labs that do skeletal muscle research or cardiac muscle research, um, actually take students in for the summer to work in these research labs. So it, it is a thing. If it's something you're passionate about, you want to get into. And I definitely, I agree with Dr. Peterson. It'll help you get into undergrad for sure. And it just kind of builds your resume from that point on, especially when you get into um, a medical program. And then somebody also asked, can you get a dual degree? Yeah, there's actually a, you can get an MD PhD if you want. It's a very long process. Um, <laughs> I don't, I got a PhD and that was very, that was a lot. <laughs> Uh, I'm very happy I did it, but it is very hard work, just like getting an MD is. So doing both at the same time, I couldn't imagine. And, you know, we have med students teaching you here, but like I said, I have a PhD. You can get a master's in science. You know, it's, these are MD, PhD, these are terminal degrees, but it doesn't mean you have to get those degrees. If you're interested in doing something and it only requires a master's degree, then go for your master's, you know that's something you do after you get your bachelor's. So again, talking to people like us, talking to your counselors, kind of getting an idea, hey, I, I like this and doing extracurriculars in that, maybe doing a little research in it. That's the other thing. You may not have to do research because it's going to help you get into med school. Do it so you know you like it. You know, do it so that you, because you, you might go and think, oh, I don't want to do this. Why would I get a degree in it? You know, but you, at least you went and got experience. So that's kind of my viewpoint on it too. So these are good questions though. And keep asking them. They're great. And I would just add to that. You were kind of alluding to that at the end there, Dr. Haggerty, that uh, volunteer work, uh, community service uh, means a lot. Uh, I sit on admissions committee for the medical school I did that at my previous place of employment as well. And volunteer work, community service are also looked uh, very highly upon. Uh, you could also do shadowing uh, of if you have uh, doctors uh, that uh, you know, um, you can shadow them. That's all very good experience. Again, to make sure that's what you really want to do. Uh, it all sounds fun, um, but when you're there and watching how things happen, maybe that's not 
what you want to do or you think hey i want to be this type of a doctor and then you do some shadowing and realize that that isn't what i want to do that's now's the time to start thinking about those things as well so it, it doesn't have to be just research but uh look for volunteer community service uh, outreach um even missions work uh, and so all of those things are very good things to add to resume Okay, hey, do we have any more questions? All great questions. That was a very good conversation. Keep them coming. Okay. Seems like we might be out of steam. <laughs> so, so uh, seeing that, um, this will conclude our this session our next session is scheduled for december 10th and we will be covering the cardiovascular and circulatory system again it will be from 6 to 8 uh, p.m uh, in the same format and we will have three uh, different uh, people presenting uh, marquise will be back mckenzie will be back and emmeline will be back for the next session um, again this uh, recording will be uploaded uh, either tonight or tomorrow and uh, you'll be able to uh, listen to the recording again yes and it'll be in youtube search for anatomy okay all right well uh, Dr. Peterson, Dr. Haggerty, Dr. Pescura, do you have anything you'd like to say before we sign off? Okay. Well, good. have a good night and good evening and uh, have a great week. We'll see you in two weeks. Okay. Bye-bye. Chloe, did you have a question? Chloe, can you unmute?